So welcome everyone for joining us today. My name is Kristen Uhlenbrock and I work with the U.S. Cliver Project Office. I want to go over just a few logistics for all of our participants. Um, we've got four presenters today. They're each going to have about 10 minutes of presentations and then we'll take Q&A right after each presentation. Um, so you can ask questions during that Q&A. We'll take a few minutes. You can ask questions two ways during that time. Uh, you can raise your hand and I'll take you off mute or you can type them into the chat feature. Um, just so you know, as I mentioned, everyone is on mute unless they're a presenter. This will help cut down on any background noise because we are recording today's webinar. So I think that's it for logistics, but I do want to go ahead and introduce and welcome Andrea Fassbender from Mbari. Andrea is, along with Stu Bishop, our presenter today, we're both co-chairs for a recent workshop we hosted on ocean carbon hotspots. And so I'll, I'll turn this over to Andrea. Um, and she'll provide some introductions. Great. Thanks, Kristen. So hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, as Kristen mentioned, this webinar is building off of some recent activities, which started with the Ocean Carbon Hotspots workshop this September at Mbari. And that workshop was really focused on bringing together observing and modeling communities to discuss biogeochemical cycling in western boundary current regions um, from the perspective of physical, chemical, and biological oceanographers as well as modelers. And what we found is there, there is a clear need for a better understanding of processes and interactions between the physics and the biogeochemistry in these regions. And there are clear opportunities um, for collaboration across the observing modeling approaches. And so um, from there, we followed up on the workshop um, with a joint US Cliver and OCB collaborated uh, version of variations in OCB news, and that uh, is entitled Frontiers in Western Boundary Current Research. And the edition is comprised of five articles that address different aspects of Western Boundary Current physics and biogeochemical cycling. And each one of the articles was led by a participant of the Ocean Carbon Hotspots Workshop. And so this seminar, or this uh, webinar, <clears throat> will be a couple of these authors um, from four of the articles presenting their work on some of the most pressing research questions and observing hurdles uh, related to Western Boundary Current re regions. And so today, we'll start off with Allison Gray from the University of Washington, and she'll be talking about the role of Western Boundary Current regions in the global carbon cycle. And then we'll go to Keith Rogers from Princeton University. Um, and each of these articles was, had uh, multiple contributors, which I'm sure the authors will, will recognize. Um, and Keith, Keith will be presenting on his work um, with collaborators on Western Boundary Currents as conduits for the ejection of anthropogenic carbon from the thermocline. Uh, Stu Bishop from North Carolina State University will be presenting um, an article led by Bo Chu from the University of Hawaii uh, entitled Decadal Variability of the Kuroshio Extension System and its Impact on Subtropical Mode Water Formation. And then Dong Zhao Zhang from NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab will, will finish up with observing air-sea interactions in western boundary currents and their extension regions and the considerations for Ocean OBS-19. And before we get started, I also just wanted to recognize Sophie Clayton, who is a postdoc at the University of Washington. And she led the fifth article entitled Fine Scale Biophysical Controls on Nutrient Supply, Phytoplankton Community Structure, and Carbon Export in Western Boundary Current Regions. And she wasn't available to present today, but I would encourage people to check out all of the articles um, in the, the Variations OCB News edition. And so with that, I am happy to turn this over to Allison for our first talk. Thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, so uh, as Andrea mentioned, I'm, uh, um, at, my name is Allison Gray, and I'm at the University of Washington. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a sort of a more of a broad overview of kind of what we know about uh, the role of Western Boundary Current systems in the global carbon cycle. I think, um, oh, and I should say that this is a, a the article in Variations was co-authored by Jamie Poulter. Um, and I think one of the things that came out of the workshop was that when we are um, thinking about these sort of interdisciplinary uh, questions in Western Boundary Currents and their extensions, um, we are, you know, we're bringing together people with a lot of different backgrounds. And so sometimes just um, uh, sort of explaining all the terminology and things I think can be uh, can be very helpful. And so, um, for 
the first part of my talk here, I'm just going to kind of go over the, the very basics. And so some of it might be uh, uh, secondhand knowledge or common knowledge to you, but um, I think because we have a lot of people from different backgrounds, it can be useful to uh, cover some of the basics. So um, I guess let me start by saying that um, when you look at a map like this one shown here, which is based on uh, um, surface um, measurements of, of the partial pressure of CO2 and seawater uh, from Takahashi, you see that these uh, five major western boundary current uh, systems in the global ocean, um, which are kind of denoted with the letters here, they all are associated with a lot of, of uh, air sea flux um, of, of carbon dioxide into the ocean. So the blue colors, yes. Okay, so the blue colors in, in the Kuroshio extension and the Gulf Stream uh, region, the Brazil Malvinas confluence, the East Australian current here, and then the uh, Gulas return current are all associated with these um, hot spots of carbon uptake by the ocean. And so, uh, what are the processes that lead to these hot spots of carbon uptake? Um, well, air sea CO2 flux is, is proportional to the difference between the atmospheric concentration of CO2 and the um, ocean uh, uh, concentration of CO2 um, in the surface ocean. And so uh, the plot on the left just shows our um, uh, measurements of atmospheric CO2 from uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory, where you can see that it's been steadily increasing since um, uh, this goes back to the 60s. And then on the right, you can see the, uh, an estimate of the surface, the mean, annual mean surface uh, ocean key CO2 concentration. And so you see there's a lot of variability in the ocean. And so in particular, in the western boundary currents, we have low uh, surface PCO2. And so what drives the PCO2 in the western boundary current systems down, and so there's really two primary ways, cooling, which is uh, the solubility pump, and then uh, pr primary production or um, biologically driven carbon uptake. And so to go over each one of those quickly, the um, ocean, <clears throat> the, the western boundary currents um, on a large scale sense are driven um, by the, well, the, the return flow for the large scale wind driven um, uh, Gyre driven, uh, sorry, <laughs> the large scale wind driven gyre circulation in each one of the subtropical basins. And so you have a, a, a large, sorry, my mouse is moving around. Okay, so we have a, a significant, significant um, uh, transport of water from the low latitudes where it's relatively warm to the mid latitudes. And so that is associated with a, a large transport of heat to the north. and in the western boundary current regions, you have um, interaction with the atmosphere, such as the ocean loses a lot of that heat to the atmosphere. So it cools the ocean. So that's the plot here. You can see the mean net surface heat flux, um, an estimate of it. And so you see the Kuroshio, the Gulf Stream, all of the, all of the western boundary current regions are associated with large fluxes of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. So it's cooling the ocean. And when we do, uh, when we cool the ocean, we increase the solubility of CO2 so the ocean can absorb more CO2. So what's shown in this little schematic, you have um, warm water moving from the tropics to the mid-latitudes in the western boundary current. And that, as that water moves to the north and loses its heat to the atmosphere, it cools and takes up more CO2. And so this is really the uh, big reason why the western boundary currents absorb uh, a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. And then the other uh, primary reason for um, uh, driving down surface ocean PCO2 in the western boundary currents is the biological pump. Or um, uh, so uh, primary production, which you can see um, in this plot here of mean annual mean chlorophyll concentrations in the ocean. That again, all of the western boundary current regions are associated with higher levels of chlorophyll. Um, and uh, uh, carbon consumption by uh, the phytoplankton drives down the surface ocean PCO2 and allows the ocean to absorb uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. 
the Western boundary currents also play a really important role in the global carbon system um, in, in terms of their impact on the storage and transport of carbon. So once, um, once the carbon is taken up in the Western boundary current regions, in order to have any sort of um, long-term effect on the atmospheric concentrations, it must be injected into the ocean interior in some way. And so Western boundary current regions are really hot spots of not only of carbon uptake, but also of um, mode water formation. So in the, that, that strong cooling of the ocean drives um, convection and deepening, deepens the mixed layer. So the plot on the upper left, you can see the maximum uh, monthly mean mixed layer depths from an Argo-based climatology. And all of the western boundary current regions are associated with deeper mixed layers. And when those mixed layers um, are capped by warmer waters in the springtime as the surface ocean warms up again, um, you get the formation of the so-called mode waters, subtropical uh, mode waters being formed on the equatorward side of this of the western boundary currents. And as you can see in this schematic, where the, the sort of bright red uh, blobs represent the subtropical mode waters. And then on the poleward side of the western boundary current, extensions you have, uh, or there you find the subpolar mode waters. So mode waters are uh, known to be important um, for the storage and uh, uptake of carbon. And in addition, the deepening of the mixed layer that occurs during mode water formation um, brings up both uh, nutrients from the de uh, deeper waters into the surface layer. And so it can help stimulate this um, phytoplankton growth and carbon uptake, but at the same time, that deepening of the mixed layer also brings up carbon, the remineralized carbon uh, into the mixed layer. And so that net effect um, in a sort of steady state system, that biological pump is going to uh, take up carbon uh, sort of in a mean net effect. But exactly how those processes occur, where in space and time that, um, that the uh, deepening of the mixed layer happens and, and the uh, production can have an uh, impact on the total carbon uptake in these systems. Okay, so the, uh, we, we like to um, separate carbon sort of frame, in a framework where we separate into the natural component, which are the, all these processes that I've just been talking about, which are assumed to have been operating since before any um, anthropogenic contributions to atmospheric CO2. And then the anthropogenic part, which um, has been uh, happening since for the past uh, several hundred years. And you can see um, it's, it's fairly easy to separate these in a model. Uh, we can run the model once uh, in keeping the atmospheric concentrations at pre-industrial levels. And then you can run the model again and increase the atmospheric uh, uh, concentrations of CO2 and, see, and take the difference, and that's your anthropogenic um, carbon. However, when we're out there observing carbon uh, in the ocean or other biogeochemical variables, it's very hard to separate the two. It uh, um, takes a lot of assumptions. and um, uh, such to do that, but from a model, it's fairly easy, easy to do. So that's what's shown in this plot uh, on the right-hand side here, where we're looking um, from McKinley et al. in 2017, where they looked at trends um, in a, a so ensemble of uh, the, um, a large ensemble run of CEFM. And so, if you look on a sh fairly short 20-year uh, time, um, sorry, 10-year time scale the trends that you see um, associated with the anthropogenic component, which would be on the left, are, are, you can't really detect much. Everywhere where it's gray, uh, the trends are not detectable above the level of internal variability. So when we're looking at short time scales, the uh, internal variability um, uh, matters quite a bit. But when we look at longer time scales, we can see um, that the anthropogenic trend really emerges almost everywhere. Okay, and then just to follow up, uh, sort of wrap up here, um, Western boundary currents are also hotspots of, <coughs> of eddy kinetic energy and mesoscale activity. And that's really um, due to the strong fronts uh, that exist there. 
and leading which uh, uh, you have these very strong fronts, this warm water on the equatorward side and cold water on the poleward side of the western boundary current extension regions, and those um, sharp uh, fronts are associated with a lot of available potential energy, which can be released through generation of mesoscale eddies. And so we find a lot of uh, mesoscale and, and submesoscale motions in the western boundary current region. And this um, the impact of, of these mesoscale eddies on carbon uptake and um, um, storage in the western boundary currents, I, I think it's still um, an open question when people are, are looking at, but we can start to make inferences based on the, on the effects that we know that mesoscale eddies have on heat. So the plots that I'm showing here are from Griffey's et al. in 2015, and so they're comparing the one, a one degree ocean um, coupled to uh, in a fully coupled uh, climate model um, on the top, and, and then a tenth of a degree ocean, so um, much better resolution of eddies. And, and there's a lot of lines here, so really all, all I want you to um, notice or look at here is this dashed green line, which is the vertical uh, transport or vertical flux of heat due to um, eddies. So in the top, it's just the, the parameter is parameterized eddies, and then in the, in the bottom plot in the high resolution model, this is the effect um, due to the resolved eddies. And you can see that there's a, a positive vertical heat flux kind of right around this um, 100 to 200 meter depth that, um, that's much stronger when you resolve the eddies. So this is kind of what we think of as the different would you know, give us an indication of what the difference between an ocean with eddies and an ocean maybe without uh, eddies. Um, or has many eddies. Uh, so in the ocean with the resolved eddies, you have a, a much uh, greater uh, heat flux due to the eddies, and that, that is basically restratifying the ocean. So the eddies in the net sense act to um, restratify the ocean so they keep the heat in the, uh, flux the heat back up into the uh, upper ocean, countering the downward diffusion and um, mean advection of heat. And because uh, heat, anthrop well, anthropogenic carbon has sort of a similar vertical profile we would expect uh, in the ocean as heat does, so you have uh, more anthropogenic carbon coming in at the surface, you have a high concentration at the surface. So we would, based on this um, analysis of the heat fluxes, we might expect that uh, in an ocean with eddies, you're going to have a, a stronger <coughs> flux of Sorry, a weaker flux of anthropogenic carbon into the interior ocean, or more of that anthropogenic carbon is going to stay in the upper ocean, and then more of the natural um, carbon that's already in the lower ocean will uh, stay there because there you have um, basically an a inverse profile of natural DIC with more DIC in the uh, deep ocean than in the surface ocean, and so we would expect that the mesoscale eddies um, would sort of have the opposite effect. Um, on the natural carbon cycle as they do on the heat and anthropogenic carbon. And so I'm just going to end with a few of the, I think, open questions that really came out of the workshop and uh, some of the recent work in this area, um, that there is a lot of internal variability in the carbon cycle in these regions, and so being able to um, understand what drives that will uh, help us um, understand the processes that are important and be able to transla translate that knowledge into greater predictive um, capability. And similarly, the small scale physical processes um, that we know are really important um, for many processes uh, in these regions, like mode water formation and restratification in the springtime, um, I think it's still an open question about what their uh, impact on the large scale carbon uptake is in these regions. And then lastly, most of our um, observations are of the northern hemisphere, western boundary current systems. And since um, estimates of anthropogenic carbon uptake indicate that the southern hemisphere has taken up quite a bit of the, uh, or the, the bulk of the anthropogenic carbon, um, I guess 50, uh, up to 50% taken up by the southern ocean. Um, we, uh, we expect that the southern 
in the sphere of Western boundary current systems will have an important role in the global carbon cycle, um, but our observations of these are definitely lacking compared to the northern hemisphere system. And with that, I will end and take any questions. Thanks, Allison. Very well Thank done. Um, I think what we'll do now is open up for any Q&A. So if you have questions, please go ahead and either raise your hand or type them into the chat feature. And we'll spend just a few moments here looking for those. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, um, we can circle back around to Allison once all the talks are done um, at that time. So why don't we move on now to Keith. Thank you very much, Allison. Keith, you're up. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for tuning in. And can, can you hear me? Is, is, um, yes, over you the sound, phone? sound very good. Thank you. Okay, great. So I am seeing the open questions on my screen. Do I need to step through to, I see, I need to step, I have control here, so. Yes, if you want to advance, perfect. Okay, I got it. Thank Great. you. Okay, so I'm going to present an overview um, of, I'll call it a, a view from the CMIP-5 class ocean carbon cycle models that, 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 um, that have been used to look at, so non-eddying global models that have been used to look at the evolution of the anthropogenic carbon transient in the ocean. And consistent with what I'll quickly just say now, that consistent with what Allison had had said, it, there's a very standard, widely used method for representing the anthropogenic carbon transient, effectively by doing two runs, one with the full contemporary carbon cycle, and then with the identical circulation, evolving circulation state, the natural carbon cycle. And the difference between those two we call the anthropogenic carbon tracer or the variable in the model. So I'll be limiting myself to that. And so this is something we don't have direct access to in the observations, but it, it can be very helpful for developing a conceptual view. And so just to frame in, in one sentence the question here that I think grew out of this very interesting meeting in, 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 on Western Boundary Current Hotspots is to what extent do modeling and observational inferences give us information on the relative um, the relative role of local and non-local processes in, in, in shaping the, 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 the way carbon is moving through these systems. Okay, so just to go on to the next slide here, I see how to do it here. Okay, so the motivation, what is the role of Western boundary currents and their extension regions in the ocean uptake of anthropogenic carbon? And a previously published modeling inference of Yu Decon et al. published last year um, with a very similar um, CMIP-5 type ocean carbon cycle model um, indicated that 60% of anthropogenic carbon is being taken up over subtropical densities for densities less than the base of the thermocline, which here is indicated by sigma 0, 26.6, and only 40% accumulates within the same density class. So if of order at the time of WOS there were 100 petagrams of carbon in the ocean, then 60% of that had originally accumulated in the thermocline, but the by the time of Wolf's, only 40% was left there. And so the EU Decone study left it as a question. Um, they, there was an interest in Western boundary currents. And as an extension of that, we're going to test the hypothesis here that Western boundary currents in their extension region serve as conduit for the ejection of anthropogenic carbon from the thermocline and into the larger subpolar reservoirs. So already you're seeing there's a framing here that these models are pretty much indicating that it's large-scale processes that are really important. And again, with the caveat that these are non-editing models that are missing a lot of processes. Okay, so just to quickly throw out a, a somewhat provocative set of diagnostics with the same model version that was used by Yu Kong, but it was presented in a, paper by, a subsequent paper by Toyama et al. in 2017, um, the, the figure on the right is the anthropogenic carbon upflux uptake by the ocean, the, the, the anthropogenic carbon flux, which that sort of idealized tracer I previously described. And on the left is the fluxes of anthropogenic carbon across the mixed layer base, with red in, in indicating um, emergence 
from the interior into the mixed layer, and blue representing something like subduction, so a passage of anthropogenic carbon downward across the base of the mixed layer. And already you can see that these models have um, lots and lots of structure with large amplitude that are not seen in the global fluxes that are organized around known dynamical structures. And sure enough, the point of including this figure is just to show that Western boundary currents are, are important. And actually, just, to, just, just one thing that's said is consistent with, with earlier work of, um, of Bo Chu from 1995 and from other inferences. Um, there's significant net reemergence of water in Western boundary currents. And so you can see in the left-hand panel that in the annual mean, for, for the case of the Kuroshio or the Gulf Stream, the, the flux of anthropogenic carbon into the Western boundary current regions from below, from reemergent thermocline waters, is significantly larger than it is for air-sea fluxes, which is already, I think, kind of interesting. And again, this has not been tested with higher resolution models. But I thought this was important for framing some of this question. Um, so that was with this NEMO model. Now we're going to just discuss the experiments with some a one degree configuration of modified bling and with the references of Griffith and Galbraith, um, great standard modeling configuration, core two normal year forcing. Um, so this, these are sort of the normal kind of community agreed upon protocols for, for, for um, running four star geochemistry models. And um, so this is with a suite of water mass transformation diagnostics. I will not get into the method here. We can come back to that during the question and session if necessary. But um, basically, this is a way to look at fluxes in the interior and to understand the role of fluxes in the interior between density classes. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suite of diagnostics that requires saving um, five-day mean or higher frequency and finding um, tendency terms from the models. And um, these have been developed over the last few years by Stephen Griffiths at GSDL, and they've been presented in a couple of papers, including a paper by Jamie Palter and a paper by Steve Griffiths. And um, so here, here is, here is, before going to those diagnostics, here's the, here's the view of, just for the Southern Hemisphere, because of time constraints, I just want to give a little bit of a focus on the Southern Hemisphere. Here's the view of anthropogenic carbon as modeled and measured at the time of blowout out in the ocean. In this, over, the, over the full southern hemisphere. And so the horizontal axis here is potential density. So light waters are actually to the right, and denser waters are to the left. And the blue line represents a density bin view that comes from, look, from, the, from combining GLODAP, um, the work of Bob Key and Chris Sabine, and World Ocean Atlas 2009 density fields, uh, temperature and salinity fields from which we calculated potential density. So, um, taking the data products that we have and looking at the density, you can see there's a peak um, in really what is sub-Antarctic mode water. I think it has, has happened the subject of a lot of interest over the last decade, two decades, that um, these kind of denser mode water classes are the recipients of, of anthropogenic carbon that's being, much of the anthropogenic car carbon that's being absorbed by the ocean. So the solid black line is the model simulation. And I want to focus on Water is lighter than 27. Just, we can come back to the densest stuff later if, if need be. But the point I wanted to make is the solid black line is the model inventory in, dense, in, in the density distribution. And the dashed line is the cumulative inventories over the full period 1851 to 1995, where the fluxes of anthropogenic carbon into the ocean have been binned by the density at which they enter the ocean. And this is considered cumulatively. So the comparison, the focus at this moment is the comparison between the dashed black and the solid black line. And the important point here is that is that for the sub-Antarctic mode water density class waters that have this large reservoir of anthropogenic carbon, not all of that is entering the ocean in the outcrops of that density class. And in fact, this diagnostic of the model is revealing that because you can see the dashed line has a local maximum over something close to 23 on the horizontal axis, there's a lot of large-scale accumulation of preconditioning of the anthropogenic carbon content that will eventually fill the, the sub-Antarctic mode water reservoir. So, okay, so how is that, how, how, how is that happening? How is, how is that water that's accumulated through gas exchange over warmer subtropical waters 
getting into the, the subantarctic smooth water density clouds. So here there are using the water mass transformation diagnostics, um, there are four panels showing fluxes across the surface within the model represents the base of the thermocline, the boundary between thermocline water and subantarctic mode waters. And um, so the upper left hand panel, red red represents a net flux of anthropogenic carbon from the thermocline to the denser or to, to subantarctic mode water. So this is an analysis done over global scales and right away you see that this the, the buoyancy driven component, which is associated with densification of waters largely through the release of heat to the atmosphere and western boundary currents, is, 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 is playing a central role. Um, so, in the southern hemisphere, you can see that over the latitude bands from 30 to 60, and there's part of this involves seasonal migration of, of, of the density horizon, of this particular density horizon, you can see there's a little bit of structure. But the red, you'll see later that the red wins. The upper right panel is a, is a diffuse, is, a, is, is a, a component associated with diffusion of temperature and, and salinity. The lower right, the lower left panel is associated with the diffusion within the model of anthropogenic carbon itself. And the total of all, there are other terms that are not included here, they're a minor. The total biotechnal flux across this surface for the year 1995 is very, similar to that shown in the upper left panel for the buoyancy driven component. So what we find here is that the net transfer of anthropogenic carbon has a strong signature of western boundary current densification facilitating a transfer of anthropogenic carbon from the thermocline to subpolar mode waters. And this is summarized in this figure um, for the region south of 30 south. So just to step you through, the upper or the left the left panel here is showing an overturning view for mass fluxes over the Southern Ocean in the model. And what's what's very interesting here is is that this is really focused on what are the formations first of the subantarctic mode water, that middle layer. So on the right you have a boundary at 30 degrees south, on the left you have the Antarctic boundary. And so we're focusing on the exchanges that are occurring across 30 south, but also exchanges between the layers. So what we're seeing is that for the formation sources of subantarctic mode water in the left panel, minus 12 from below means a net transfer from Antarctic intermediate water densities into subantarctic mode water densities of 12 teraflops. And the 4.786 from above at that upper layer interface represents a net transfer of um, almost five square drops from thermocline densities into subantarctic mode water densities. So what we learned from that left panel for the behavior of this mom model is that approximately 70% of the formation source of subantarctic mode water is from denser waters. Most likely um, it's, it's, sub, it's, it's circumpolar deep water that's upwelled and has gained buoyancy in the polar section so um, before eventual um, Subduction in sub, uh, subantarctic mode water. But the figure on the right shows an equivalent framing of the fluxes of anthropogenic carbon. And what's going on there is very, very different. So, what we see is that the formation sources of subantarctic mode water for anthropogenic carbon have, in fact, don't have a source from the Antarctic intermediate water density class. In fact, there's a small flux going from subantarctic mode water to Antarctic intermediate water. Whereas there's um, there's a there's a flux of 0.22 petagrams coming from thermocline water, and this is what we saw in the previous figure with the role of the western boundary currents. This is anthropogenic carbon that's being transferred within the western boundary currents for this non-eddying model, and that's of order one third of the total accumulation for that layer. So you can see at the outcrop of the Antarctic mode water, there's 0.39 petagrams of carbon per year. And so it's a relatively a balance of about two to one for the gas exchange and the, um, the, the diapicnal exchange from TW thermocline water to subantarctic mode water. So it's, it's important to recognize that there's a very strong amplification of this relative to the 70%, 30% um, story that is in the left panel to the, the dominance of the, of the thermocline pathway, the TW pathway in the right figure. 
And that's that's something that is not really absolutely clear yet. Why why there's such a, such a pronounced amplification? And undoubtedly, there's there's a role for the Revell factor, but there there could certainly be other other reasons why you could have a rectified or an amplified response through the seasonal cycle in the formation history of waters. And so that's 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 that. This is the point we've reached with the model diagnostics and. Um, and this raises as many questions as it answers. Okay, so let's go on to the next figure. Um, I did want to point out that building on studies that have been done, several studies that have looked at renewal time scales for different water masses, um, and, and these have usually typically been um, database studies, can take, they'll take the volume of a, of a particular water, interior water mass and divide it by the formation rate, and this gives a time scale, volume divided by, by formation rate, which is going to be in terms of um, typically the, the, the subduction rate for that for that um, water mass. And we've done this actually by using by looking at net transfers across this 26.4 surface that's the boundary between the thermocline and subantarctic mode water. We've identified that in the annual mean there are 70 stair drops going each way. So when we took the volume of the full thermocline and divided it by the 70 square drop exchange rate, plus or minus 10%, because of issues with residuals with the method of water mass transformation diagnostics, we came up with a renewal time scale for the full thermocline of 32 plus or minus three years, so approximately three decades, which is interesting. It's suggesting that over the time scale of, of, um, of from the Wolf's era until just about now, the beginning of the Wolf's era until just about now, the it's approximately in this model view, it's approximately equal to, to, to a full potential renewal of the, of the thermocline waters themselves. So that's, that's much more rapid than what we expected, and so we're still trying to interpret that. Um, but I think it's kind of a, also a somewhat provocative result, given that Rena Fine and other people have spent a lot of time identifying the ventilation age with the thermocline itself as being of order 15 years. Um, this, is, this seems to be very uh, kind of a low number. So, in conclusion, uh, western boundary currents and their extension regions have been demonstrated in this CMIP 5 class, MOM 5 topaz model, to be the principal conduits for ejection of anthropogenic carbon from the thermocline. And so, this is really an extension of the work of E.D. Cohn because we've gotten a little bit more into the, into the specifics of this, the, the, the mechanism. And for both anthropogenic carbon and mass, the thermocline, sorry, just has a typo. So, so the anthropogenic carbon, the thermocline CW formation source of sub Antarctic motor water in the Southern Ocean is amplified um, for the region south of 30 south relative to the Antarctic intermediate water source. And we think that the Gravel factor is contributing there. And the third point is that there's a renewal time scale for the full thermocline that may be as short as three decades. Um, and that would have a number of implications for, you know, for, for heat heat suffering by the ocean and for biogeochemistry in general and biology. So um, this is this is uh, this is the view that emerges of from a non editing model emphasizing large scale preconditioning in setting the preformed carbon content in subducting mode waters and um, oops any I just click something here. Any questions would be appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. All righty, any quick questions for Keith? Um, we'll probably take one now if any comes through. If not, we'll hold off to the end so we can get through everyone. Hey, Keith, do you have any uh, a priori sort of hypothesis what a, an eddy resolving model, if that would change your result or not? It's, it's an open question, right? It's, 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 it's not clear to what extent these models, I guess I, one, one, quite, one question that had come up at the, at, at the workshop was, you know, there are these scales that you can see in the observations for convection in the western boundary current regions, and there was a lot of talk about the Kuroshio region, and we just don't know. So it's, it's not yet clear the extent to which um, local processes can, can modulate these large-scale preconditioning pre but it's it's very important to figure out if 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 these if these cl 
climate models, and we've seen it in the NEMO model and in the, and the MOM5 model, and these are two of the most widely used models, we need to find out. It's, it's, it's an, I, I think there's a lot of value in figuring out whether small-scale processes are important because that would mean these climate models are wrong. You know, we, 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 we have to think of clever ways to constrain that. So I would say it's an open question. Great, thank you, Keith. Uh, well, that was Stu. So Stu, um, why don't we just kind of slip right into your presentation? Thanks, Keith. Sounds good. All right, thanks for joining in. I'm going to be giving this talk on behalf of Bo Chu, who led this effort, and we're basically going to be talking about what has been observed uh, mainly through satellite uh, remote sensing and that we see decadal variability in the crucial extensions and its impacts on wood water formation. So as an outline, I uh, uh, will talk about what we have observed in the satellite record for the Cursor Extension region specifically, and talk about how the, the phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is linked to the Cursor Extension variability. So it gives us some, some predictability in the system. Uh, and then for the third point, talk about the impacts of the variability on subtropical mud water formation and for the last slide, I, I put up some open questions that uh, I would say echo some of the previous talks that Allison and, and Keith uh, addressed. So here is a picture of the Crystal Extension, and I, I like to call it a vacillation because not, this is not, you know, a regular oscillation that we, we see in the system like a sine wave. It's more like uh, the... NAO in terms of, a, of an oscillation. So if you take the sea surface height from the remote sensing of the Aviso product and you were to plot one particular contour representing the Krisha extension jet axis and you plot that every other week for every year, you get this nice spaghetti diagram that's been in a lot of studies that Bo Chu first produced in 2005, I believe. Uh, and if you look more closely, in particular years, uh, you highlight 1994, there's 2002 to 2004, and then 2011 to 2012. Uh, the Croatia extension in the first 1,000 kilometers east of Japan takes more of a, more or less the same pathway throughout the given year. And then it transitions into these periods that you have rapid uh, modulation of the system, and it's hard to tell from a year where the actual jet is at any given moment. It is pretty much all over the place. And uh, it's been coined the unstable state and uh, when it's in this sort of meandering state. And so from that, it's been linked that at least there's a correlation between the phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Chris Extension Variability. So on the left in A, this is an index of the Chris Extension. This is a combination of things such as the southern recirculation gyre intensity, the intensity of the Chris Extension jet, and its latitudinal position since it migrates north and south. And from that, and B, this is just showing that during certain years you have a mean sea surface height that is dramatically different. In 2011, you have a stronger uh, southern recirculation gyre. You can see that. Let's see if I have an arrow. Bring up this guy. In this region, you have a really strong anticyclonic circulation, which intensifies the, the transport of the crust extension during these stable states. And comparing 2011 and 2004 with years like 2008, 1997, you have a much weaker recirculation gyre. And 1997, it almost looks like it's not even there. And what has been linked to this is that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation has about a three to four year lag. So what the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is doing, you can expect three to four years later the crystal extension is going to change based on that. So the color coded here is blue is positive PDO, 
and red is negative PDO. And the positive PDO, I like to think of the PDO is more or less a, a metric for the strength of the wind stress curl over the Central Pacific. So during the positive PDOs, you're going to have a stronger uh, wind stress curl, and that will generate the sea surface height anomalies that are in C here. And so you have these sea surface height anomalies. Since they're stronger, uh, stronger wind stress curl, you're going to drive negative sea surface height anomalies relative to some long-term mean. And so these sea surface height anomalies propagate west, and when they impinge on the crest extension region, they force the jet south. So when the Croatia extension is further south, it tends to transition into a more unstable state where it is meandering quite vigorously, and that is indicated by the negative or the blue in the Croatia extension index. During the negative PDO phase, when you have a weaker wind stress curl, you, you drive positive sea surface height anomalies, and when they impinge on the jet, they force it north, and, uh, and, and subsequently, the crest extension relaxes into a more stable configuration pattern. And I'd say one of the big open questions for me is that uh, this, it's quite clear the relationship between the PDO and uh, whether the crest extension is further north or south, but what actually triggers it to meander more is still an open question, I believe. So what we know from the meandering states let's see, is that it has a, a dramatic impact on how much subtropical mode water forms during the winter in the given years. So on the top here in A, this is the temperature of the recirculation gyre, and this is averaged from all of the Argo floats available in that region and the whatever XPTs and CTDs and XCTs that were taken, I guess, from ships that happened to be in the area at the time. So this is the time series going back to the beginning of the satellite era in 1993 to present in 2017. And in the bottom is a plot of the potential vorticity in the recirculation jar. So this is mainly a measure of the stratification in this case. So if you think of the buoyancy frequency and the Coriolis parameter, it's a combination of those two because from the given observations, we can't calculate relative vorticity for this. Uh, I guess for this calculation, it wasn't done. You probably could calculate it. Uh, so what, what is observed is that the mixed layer in black and A is the black contour, that it is deeper during certain years and it's shallower during different years. And it coincides that when the mixed layers are deeper, these are your stable states, the Crucio extension. And when the uh, mixed layers are shallower, this coincides with unstable states. So you can imagine that there are more eddies during the unstable state, and they're somehow causing the mixed layer to not deepen as much during these given years. And in contrast, the mode water dramatically changes whether you're in an unstable or stable state. So when the mixed layers are shallow, uh, you have a lot more eddy variability in the region. There's more mesoscale eddies that are being shed from the cursor extension. And I would assume there are also more uh, sub-mesoscale processes as well. And so you have a dramatic increase in the potential vorticity. And there's been two studies I'm aware of that address why this is this increase. But you led a study where the presence of a, a cold core ring that is shed from the crest extension that it would have a high potential vorticity core and that it actually transfers its high potential vorticity core into the surrounding waters when it's in the, the south of the jet, which would raise the potential vorticity. There's also a study that I led based on observations from the Crucio Extension System study where there's actually a transfer when you have cold core rings a forming stage before it's detached. You have a lot of cross-front exchange upstream of the ring formation and that this can transfer high PV waters from the north side of the jet to the south side of the jet. So there's some competing 
factors that can enhance the PV. During your stable states, you have low PV, so this is indicative of a really thick layer of mowed water volume that's forming during this time. And so we have these thick layers that increase during the stable states and erode during the unstable states. And given that we know that the volume of the mode water is dramatically changed, uh, I have some open questions that sort of echo what's already been said. And I, I want to leave with, you know, what are the impacts of subtropical mode formation variability on carbon uptake? So we know that it has this large in your annual variability. It's tied to times when we have more eddies or less eddies. Is carbon uptake impacted by more physical processes or is the biological productivity playing a major role during these times? There has been some evidence that there is more primary productivity when you have more eddies. So there's this competing process that could take up more carbon when mixed layers are, are shallower and, and not as much mud water is forming. And then the third question is, do unstable states with more mesoscale and sub-mesoscale eddies versus stable states inhibit subtropical mode formation, which indirectly would affect carbon uptake? And so it's a, it's a big open question that I have. And uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Great. Thanks, Stu. All righty. Any questions right now? Uh, we do have one that we have a couple that have come in, Stu. So why don't I read these out loud so folks, um, everyone else can hear them. We have one um, from Gail Forget. To what extent do eddying models, say at 0.1 degree resolution, capture the stable and unstable phases of the Kuroshio extension? Hi, Gail. That's a great question. I have a 2015 publication that looks into this. We have a 100-year coupled simulation from NCAR that is 0.1 degree ocean and a quarter degree atmosphere. And we do see this link between the, uh, the PDO and the Kershaw extension states. Uh, and we find that that actually has large impacts on the air sea impacts on the jet stream. One thing I note is that you really need a coupled simulation to see this phase locked in with the PDO. If you run a 10th degree ocean model that's just run with your core forced winds that are annually repeating, you're going to get decadal variability, but it's more or less internal variability. And if you were to plot up the PDO, it, there wouldn't be any link between what we know happens in observations. So that was one key result that we're finding is that you really need that coupled simulation to drive that that link. Great, thanks. And also, a follow up, another question here from Wilfred Gardner. Does the Gulf Stream have a similar stable and unstable state? Not that I'm aware of. I know that it, it does modulate and has some bit of bimodality, but I don't think it's as, as dramatic as we see in the Kershaw extension. I mean, you really shut off completely ring formation during years when it's stable. And I don't know if I've ever seen, uh, I've looked at, I've tried to compare it to the Gulf Stream and it seems to always be shedding rings. All righty, thanks. Um, why don't we move on to Deng Zhao? And if anyone has further questions, we'll take them once we're done here. Thanks, Stu. Uh, hi, Kristen, can I use my, uh, can I share my screen? I Absolutely. need to show some animation. Yes, please but go ahead and, and share your share. desktop with us. Yep. All right. Uh, okay. Great. And if you want to uh, use the minimize on that toolbar at the right-hand side with the, with the green arrow, use the minimize one on the far right side. Okay. And then you can um, play your um, slideshow as well. All right. Good. All right, the, the title is uh, Observing RC Interaction in the West Boundary Currents and Their Extension Regions uh, for the Consideration of uh, Ocean Observation 2019. I would uh, first uh, like to acknowledge my co-authors for their contribution. 
you have seen these uh, two figures from uh, Allison's talk. They clearly show that the westbound recurrence and their extensions are characterized by the intense ARC heat, momentum, buoyancy, and CO2 fluxes. The excess heat absorbed by the ocean in the tropics is transported forward mainly by the westbound recurrence and then released back to the atmosphere along the westbound recurrence in mid latitudes at the subtropical and the subarctic boundaries. For this reason, the westbound recurrent regions are referred to as the climatic hotspots. Likewise, the westbound recurrent regions are ocean carbon hotspots. They are the areas of large CO2 uptake that counterbalance the large CO2 outgassing in the tropics. In the Ocean Observation 09 white paper, Cronin et al. made strong recommendations to include multidisciplinary observations in westbound recurrent region. Uh, the present need for such an observing system is more urgent than ever. The motivation here is to engage the community to develop a future western boundary current regional observing systems. We welcome any comments, suggestions, and collaborations for such a joint adventure. Uh, I will first review existing West Boundary Current Observing System with a focus on the Kyushu extension, since the Kyushu extension is one of the best observed West Boundary Current systems. The experience and knowledge gained from the Kyushu extension observing system can offer a roadmap for developing other systems in similar regimes. One central part of the Kyushu extension observing system is the, the long-term Ocean Climate Reference Station, the NOAA Kyushu Extension Observatory, marked by the red stars in the two maps. I will then briefly discuss the challenges and the, the new technologies that can be used to meet these challenges. Finally, uh, a conceptual westbound recurrent regional observing system will be offered for discussion. Sorry. Uh, uh, you go back to share again, and then you right. want to use the, um, there's a little dash line on the right-hand side. On the right there you go. Okay, got okay. it. All right. Uh, Kiel is a heavily instrumented moored surface buoy. It has been measuring the surface air sea heat, momentum, buoyancy, and the CO2 fluxes for more than a decade. It also measures the upper 500 meter ocean variability associated with the, the air sea interaction. The data are freely available in real time through the data display and the delivery web page and are available on the GTS. The left figure is uh, directly plotted from the display web page showing the increase in TCO2 in the air and ocean surface at Kiel and other essential surface variables for calculating LC heat fluxes. The top right figure shows the upper ocean stratification and the mode water formation described by the subduction of uh, low potential vorticity waters from the winter mixed layer deepening caused by the large winter heat loss as observed by Kiel. The lower right cartoon illustrates the possible biophysical processes that could be involved in the mode water formation and uh, CO2 uptake. These processes has, well, uh, has been well explained in the previous talks I won't get into the details, just point out that uh, the carbon uptake in the West Boundary Current is largely controlled by the physical processes involving winter heat loss, the subduction, and mold water formation. The biological pump also play an important role in determining the magnitude of uh, natural carbon uptake. Uh, and it's uh, strongly regulated by energetic fronts and the mesoscale and mesoscale edits that supply nutrients to the euphotic zone where upwelling and cross-frontal exchange between high nutrient cold subarctic and low nutrient warm subtropical waters. These small scale fast, process, fast processes are not well observed. Questions remain about the importance of these biological processes in local anthropogenic carbon uptake relative to other large scale chemical and the physical processes.
This animation shows the energetic eddy field in the culture extension. You see the cold eddies spun off from the jet would likely to bring high nutrient cold subarctic water into the subtropical gyre. Meanwhile, the warm eddies the warm eddies also spun out from the jet, bring warm water to the cold region, and would likely lead to enhanced heat loss to the atmosphere. As shown by Stu's work, Stu's talk, the eddy activity has a tendency of a decadal vacillation. That's a new term that links to the PDO and uh, the moon water formation. Although the heat released from the ocean to the atmosphere is, largely, is, is large along the west boundary currents, the evidence of ocean influence the atmosphere in the west boundary current region only became available very recently, and it could only be found near sharp FT fronts associated with the west boundary currents. In the Japanese half-bath field campaign, the simultaneous measurements from three research vessels represented by the three circles, uh, each occupying about half degree going back and forth along 143 East, were able to show large latent and uh, sensible heat flux immediately south of the front and significant uh, atmospheric boundary layer response in different conditions of northerly and southerly wind. On the other hand, my all shows that the mesoscale ocean and the atmosphere interaction due to warm eddies pinched off, pinched off from the Kyushu extension bring the warm water and the large heat release in the cold subarctic region not only affects the atmospheric circulation but also regulates the Kyushu extension jet and its eddy state. These studies motivated the deployment of a a Chinese keel, sea keel, to the north of the Kyushu extension last month. Characterized by the strong winds, high seas, and fast deep currents, the west boundary current, what the west boundary current regions are some of the most challenging environments. The left figure shows the tropical cyclone Fengshan passing over keel with the recorded wind over 78 miles per hour, you often get up to three to four typhoons and the tropical cyclones passing over Kiel in a year during summer and early fall. After experiencing strong, deep currents associated with uh, the pinch-off eddy from the Kiel jet, the, the, the Kyushu extension jet, for more than two months, Kiel is now adrift. Our Japanese colleagues have worked hard had worked very hard to schedule a December cruise to rescue, highlighting the importance of uh, the international collaboration in this uh, challenging environment. From what we learned in the Kyushu extension, quantifying CO2 uptake and understanding the Earth's interaction processes requires an observing system to overcome the lack of coverage across the front and eddies in the West Boundary current systems. And yet, because of the strong deep jets and eddies, more the long-term reference buoys, the most robust platform in providing high-quality, high-frequency simultaneous measurements of air-sea fluxes and upper ocean variability, are recommended to be deployed outside of the jet axis, but in the flanks of the jets like a keel. To resolve sharp fronts and uh, small-scale eddies, autonomous self-propelled platforms have been more and more regularly used in the process studies, such as the Sinity process in the Upper Ocean Regional Study SPURS field campaign. This year's SPURS 2 field observation includes a new autonomous platform, the Sail Drone. Unlike other autonomous platforms, the Sail Drone does not require ship time. Two Sail Drones were launched from San Francisco and reached the Spurs 2 region on their own. After RV Rewell picked up uh, the moorings and gliders, deployed the surface drifters and, uh, and Argo flows steamed back to San Diego, 
the two cell zones will continue the meridional sections and repeatedly cross fronts and vortices of course, the vortices associated with the tropical instability waves and cool down for another three months before returning to San Francisco. Here is the diagram shows uh, all standard sensors installed on the cell drone. This is real a uh, global class unmanned surface vehicle for observing Earth interactions with wind and solar powered with the average speed three to five knots, maximum speed of eight knots, depending on wind. The longest voyage so far is 16,000 kilometers in 12 months. It measures air sea heat and momentum flux, air sea CO2 flux, the surface the chlorophyll concentration, dissolved oxygen pH, SFT, sea surface salinity, and the skin temperature, the ocean currents in the upper 100 meter by the ADCP. Here we propose a conceptual West Boundary Current Regional Observing System to measure multi-scale, multidisciplinary processes with uh, international collaboration. The five in situ components are long-term, more climate reference buoys equipped with uh, air sea flux, physical and biogeochemical sensors, and sediment traps, preferably at the opposite flanks of the West Boundary Current extension jets. Uh, real for like ranging flows, especially biogeochemical argo flows. Underwater gliders for controlled observations across fronts and eddies. Unmanned surface vehicle sections crossing West Boundary Current regional fronts and eddies around and between the reference buoys. Underwater seaboard measurements, including launch of weather balloons when crossing fronts and eddies during flow deployments and the glider observations operations. Of course, we need satellite remote sensing to provide large-scale context of these in-situ observations. Thank you. Thank you, Dong Zhao. Okay, we'll open this up to any questions that anyone has for Dong Zhao or any of the other speakers. Um, so while you're doing that, feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat feature. And I do want to point out, um, Allison McDonald earlier had asked a question um, was there any discussion at the workshop about observations that are needed to improve our understanding of Western boundary currents in the carbon cycle? And Dong Zhao, I think this kind of framework that you've put up right here really answers a lot of what, her question that she was getting at. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to address her question, but I think, I think you did a nice job trying to outline some of these observing system requirements. Thank you. That's an excellent question, and uh, we will very welcome uh, Alison to you know, give us the feedback uh, to uh, point out uh, what are the important uh, uh, processes uh, that we missed, uh, what are the platforms we can use. Great. And Allison, just so you know, um, we're going to have a recording of this available and the slides as well. So if you want to go back and reference um, this slide in particular, we'll, we'll make that available for you. So are there any questions at all? for our speakers today. I think um, everyone did a really excellent job, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll, I'll pause here just for a moment. Hello, this is... Keith, this, this, this please, please go ahead. Yes, I wanted to see if I could, if I could show a figure and, and actually do a, do a screen share. You can. So go to the share button at the top and select mm -hmm. your monitor and or your desktop and you can share whatever figure. We'll see. Yep. Just one second. Here it is. And okay, so just try this and see if it works. Can you see this? We can see it. Are you showing um, change rates? Yes, yes. There's yes. A, it's a figure on the right. So this is this is something that was shown at the meeting, and I think this is, you know, there's been some thinking about what are the observational challenges and what 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 are the important questions that that, that are open for both modeling and observations. And I just I just wanted to remind people that during the during the meeting there was a talk given by Oka from from University of Tokyo, and he presented this these figures that you can see on your screen are from his 2015 paper. 
And so panel C on the right, the, the panel that spans the year 2002 to 2014 or 2013, these are from the, J the JMA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency has done, you know, three or four occupations per year along 137 East. And these are samples at 25 degrees north on the Sigma Theta 25 surface. So these are basically in, these are basically in sub these are in the subtropical mode water density class in the interior. So these are, these are the, without question, the most you know, highly temporally sam sampled um, measurements that, are, that, that, that exist for subtropical mode water downstream from the formation region. And I think that the challenge that's posed by this is that you can see, okay, over a decade, there's an increase of approximately, you know, there's an increase of approximately 10 micromolar per year, okay? And there is year-to-year -year variability, but there's, in this figure, there's not really a strong indication of the kinds of, um, you know, stable and unstable, or at least I don't know. I don't know. There's there's a question of what, is, what are the periods of stable and unstable variability that were first reported by Bo Chu are really reflected here. So I guess I guess that the question that can be raised here is, although small scale processes may be very very important, and I, I don't I certainly don't know the answer. But although small-scale processes are very important for the volume of subtropical mode water that's formed from year to year, is it possible that this panel C on the right side from, from, the, from the, the OCA paper is telling us that, in fact, that's not for carbon. There is, a diff there is year to year variability in the subduction rate of anthropogenic carbon. As you can see, there's an increasing trend in, in carbon on the surface. But that even though there are variations in the, in the formation rate, the concentrate that PCO2 in the formation region is really tracking the atmosphere from year to year to year, and that there's actually not much else going on for carbon other than that you have one micromolar per year increase in concentration, but variability in the formation rate, right? So is, is there any, I guess my question is, is there, is there any observational, as a, as a kind of a challenge for thinking about observations, is there, is there any information that challenges the view that you just have a smoothly through time varying DIC con preformed DIC content, which is basically what this is, um, you know, that is just has, has a monotonic increase in time that's not, that concentration is not really very strongly impacted by these dynamical <coughs> modulations, but the volume is modulated of what's pumped into the interior. Is, is, there, anything, is there anything that challenges that view? Isn't a question. I guess this kind of came up at the meeting and it wasn't resolved. But I think this this is a really valuable resource, these JMA measurements, and it'd be nice to refer back to some of the dynamical story in interpreting this to see if there's any any signature that's really sh of those dynamical changes that are showing up in in this very important C panel here. So that I'll leave that as an open question. Great. I do think it's a, an open question, and um, you know, following on a little bit, we are going to be putting together a workshop report um, for those of you who are on the webinar and wasn't able to attend. And I think outlining some of these open questions in that report will be very essential. Um, so yeah, so we're working on that now, and, and I don't know, um, Keith. Well, not necessarily. You won't be involved in that in particular, but the working group organizers will be, and we can make sure to kind of include something along those lines. Great. Great. Yeah. Hey, Keith, if, oh. Go ahead, Stu. Oh, I was going to say, Keith, uh, if you scroll up to figure six in that same paper, I'm wondering, you know, the, the white line that shows up, this is where they take those observations. And if that is inherently biasing our, your viewpoint or our viewpoint, because we really don't have measurements of this time anywhere where you have most of the mud water formation. This is really off to the left in left field. Um, my understanding is that this is 130. My understanding, hold on. I thought that all these measurements were taken from that white line of transects on the, the cruises, they do repeat cruises. 
um, we need to resolve this. Yeah, this is this is a good question. I thought that these were from 137 East. It is from 137 East. Oh, uh, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think it, I think it is actually within the pertinent. Well, that, I mean that would be at 137. That would be what the last point on that line. Mm -hmm. I, it's hard for me to tell, um, but yeah. So th this is something. This 30, is something I mean, this uh, is. I don't know. They have they have data that goes all the way up to. I mean, that's just one point that they chose in that paper. They have data that's as yet. I think a lot of it's unpublished. It does go all the way up to, you know, thirty or thirty north of north of thirty north. And and so there there's there is data there is data and I have I I you know I I guess um, Masao Ishii was not at the meeting but he has presented this stuff in international conferences and I, I I can I can say with confidence that that he doesn't see and I spoke with him in in um, October about the last month about this he doesn't see modulations of preformed salinity normalized carbon in subtropical mode water. You know, looking even more extensively along that section. So this this seems like it should be it should be a pretty powerful constraint for understanding if there's any evidence of carbon preformed salinity normalized carbon um, within this water mass. It's 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 at least a question which can be addressed, right? Of 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 is there any indication that the concentrations are responding? If there's anything other than the first order ocean tracking of PCO2. So really the more general question is, what, what are the processes in the ocean, whether large scale or local scale, that set this, the, the carbon concentrations, the total carbon concentrations in subducting water? And we'll call that preformed carbon. So it should be consistent with what the carbon community language is. You know what? What are the what what are the what are the controls, local and non-local, on preformed carbon? And I'd say that's there's there's certainly um, there certainly are observations to figure out whether that is being strongly modulated by stable and unstable periods, and um, at least from that figure ten in in Oka's paper. I'd say it's un, I, 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 let's leave it. It's it's unresolved, right? So let's um, yeah. So let's um. I think these are I think these are really good open and it's some questions that Keith is raising here. Um, but I do want to be cognizant that we are we are losing some people. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if you all know the answer. Um, I know this was brought up during the workshop, but uh, one of our participants, Wilford, wanted to know the depth at which the sediment trap near the KEO site is, and if there's plans for other instruments um, at depth, like particle op optical measurements. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Cha. All right. Yeah, the sediment tribe currently is at about 5,000 meters, which is uh, about 800 meters above the ocean floor. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, currently the, the, the KEO buoy doesn't have much uh, biogeochemical sensors in the subsurface. The biogeochemical sensors mainly equipped in the surface uh, measurements. So yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll be would be very happy to have uh, the biogeochemical sensors uh, uh, for the for the buoy in the in the water column. But we currently uh, don't have the plan. Uh, but please uh, give us a. Uh, uh, um, any information or any uh, uh, anything you want to uh, install? Up. Great, thank you. Yeah, so if there's anyone on here who has follow up, you either want to connect with one of the presenters with additional questions back and forth or follow up um, for collaboration. Um, you should have contact. You can Google folks and find it, or reach out to me, kyulenbrock at usclaver.org, and I can put you in contact with folks as well. Um, I think this was really great presentations today, and I appreciate everyone for staying on for a little bit extra time to hear everything and, and hear some of the, 
the Q&A. So I want to say a big thank you um, to everyone who presented as well as writing articles for our Variations and OCB News Joint Edition. Um, it really is an excellent read and I recommend everyone go look at that. It's on the U.S. CLIVAR website as well as the U.S. Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry Program's website and read the articles. Um, and thank you for participating. We will put a copy of this up on the website and feel free to share it with those who are unable to join us today. So. Thanks, everyone, and, and have a good day. <laughs>